Hello, I'm Harlan Krumholz. I'm a cardiologist and professor of medicine at the Yale School of Medicine, and I also study long COVID. I'm here today to talk to you about Paxlovid for the treatment of long COVID. Here are my disclosures. Of note, I co-lead the PAX-LC trial, a phase two randomized trial sponsored by Pfizer to test the effectiveness and safety of Paxlovid 15 days in the treatment of patients with long COVID. Here are my presentation goals. First, to provide a rationale for antiviral treatment of long COVID. Second, to discuss why Paxlovid is a good candidate for the treatment of long COVID. And third, to describe the PAX-LC trial and other ongoing studies. So first, viral persistence is a leading hypothesis for the cause of long COVID. And you know, here's an example from something that appeared in Lancet in which a group of investigators presented a pathophysiologic model of long COVID based on the persistence of SARS-CoV virus. They said it would trigger dysregulation of the immune system followed by increases in the release of inflammatory cytokines and abnormal endothelial damage, ultimately leading to the development of chronic inflammation, vascular damage, hypercoagulability, microthrombosis, and multi-organ uh, dysfunction. And so this, like many people, it, it represents a conceptual model about how all of this can come together. Now, there've been many studies, and here are just a few examples, that have actually shown viral persistence. People who many months after the acute infection with SARS-CoV-2 virus, showing that the virus is persisting within their body, within different body systems that, that have been looked at. And as a result, there are also review articles, even systematic reviews, that again are emphasizing this point of viral persistence as a leading hypothesis for the cause of long COVID. And so, you know, more recently, even just a couple weeks ago, there was something that appeared in Nature Immunology that was a pretty deep dive into this. And in this study led by Amy Prohl uh, and senior author was John Weary, they said that some individuals with PASC, long COVID, may not fully clear coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 after acute infection, instead replicating virus or viral RNA potentially capable of being translated to produce viral proteins persist in tissue as a reservoir. This reservoir could modulate host immune responses or release viral immune proteins into the circulation. They had a, a series of figures that were very useful and I recommend them to you. Here's one that was showing the uh, identification of SARS-CoV-2 RNA and protein after COVID-19. A variety of studies looking at different tissues, for example, the first one, appendix, skin, breast tissue, the second one, gut mucosa, the third, olfactory, neural endoepithelium. Uh, so these are just examples, well, actually, in their view, were comprehensive lists of studies showing either RNA, protein, and then correlating those in many cases with past symptoms, past symptoms, but in some cases, people were asymptomatic, but they're demonstrating that there's more than one study, in fact, many studies, that are talking about this viral persistence. And then they went on to show a, a, a conceptual model of mechanisms by which this reservoir may contribute to PASC. In the same way those who wrote that Lancet piece sort of had a conceptual model, this is a conceptual model from a bunch of scientists sort of saying, well, how might that contribute to what we're seeing as a clinical manifestation of long COVID? And, and again, I don't have to go through all of these, but, but it's ways in which this viral persistence, this reservoir could be perturbing uh, the body and, and manifesting itself in the kind of disability that we're seeing in these patients. Now, what about Paxlovid as a as a uh, agent which can address this viral reservoir and perhaps be used to treat long COVID. Well, let, let's just get some basic information, some basic background on Paxlovid. The, the SARS-CoV-2 main protease, M-PRO, is a virally encoded enzyme that's essential for viral replication. So, you know, th this is extraordinarily important to coronaviruses and to SARS-CoV-2. And there's no close human analog to MPRO. So, so this is good, right? There's, there's a protease that exists that's important for replication, but it's not, doesn't appear to be existent and therefore essential for other human uh, functions within physiology. And then there was a development of uh, Nermotrelvir, which is an orally bioavailable MPRO inhibitor with effectiveness against SARS, uh, 
actually SARS-CoV-2 emperor. And uh, what's important, I think, here is that both that this exists against the coronaviruses uh, largely, but also it is specific. It can help. Uh, the, the, it itself is not specific, but it's also generalizable to the SARS-CoV-2 protein. And again, it has little or no activity against human proteases outside of this MPRO, which is also important. This drug is, is specific for this viral protease. Now, it's often paired, or let me just say in Paxlovid, it is paired with ritonavir, which has no antiviral activity, uh, but can increase plasma levels of nimetrovir due to inhibition of CYP3A mediated metabolism so that it can potentiate, amplify the effects by raising the levels within the body. And that's why these two drugs are paired. Now, a big uh, advance in the treatment of COVID-19 was the introduction of Paxlovid. For, for a long time, it was used under an emergency use authorization of the FDA, but now uh, it has been approved. Uh, this is the press release of the FDA approval. FDA approves the first oral antiviral for the treatment of COVID-19 in adults. This came out May 25th of this year. And today the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved the oral antiviral uh, Paxlovid for the treatment of mild to moderate COVID-19 in adults who are at high risk for progression to severe COVID-19, including hospitalization or death. Uh, it is the fourth drug, the first oral antiviral pill, but the fourth antiviral approved by the FDA to treat COVID-19 in adults. So this was a five-day course uh, to be able to treat people. You're all familiar with this, of course, but just to say that this was a big advance. And this was built on the EPIC HR uh, study. Of course, there are more studies than this, but it was important. This study was very important. This panel in the figure B is sort of showing you the benefit of Paxlovid in these individuals, uh, importantly, unvaccinated individuals, for the prevention of hospitalization, COVID-related hospitalization or death from any cause through day 28 among those people who were treated. And just to review some of this, so. So it was that um, basically people uh, had to be having uh, symptoms for three days or less, and then they were treated every 12 hours for five days with, with Paxlovid versus a matching placebo. And, uh, you know, in the end, there were 697 people in the uh, Paxlovid group and 682 in the placebo group. And the total uh, number of patients with an event, including hospitalization or death from any cause, was only five in the in the Paxlovid group, uh, including no deaths, five COVID-related hospitalizations, compared to 44 COVID-related hospitalizations in the placebo group, and nine deaths from any cause, which were part of those hospitalizations. And it led to a relative risk reduction of 89% of COVID-related hospitalizations or deaths. So very successful um, and was sort of proof of concept that that, that inhibition of MPRO could translate into clinical benefit when used in the acute setting. Their conclusion as compared with placebo, nematolial plus fritonavir reduced the risk COVID-19 related hospitalization and death from any cause in symptomatic, unvaccinated, non-hospitalized patients at high risk for progression to severe COVID-19, a big advance. Now, this led people to start thinking about this idea of Paxlovid as a potential treatment for long COVID. This, this paper just came out from, from uh, Matthew McCarthy, but, but people have been thinking about this for a long time. It's if, if, in fact, a viral repository, a persistence of SARS-CoV-2 is one of the causes or one of the main causes of long COVID. And, and I think many of us are thinking that, in fact, long COVID may be uh, represented by people who have different causes. And and so, you know, the, this may not be the singular cause and people may have different causes. It may, by the way, be that the reservoir incites the reactivation of other viruses, or it may just be that other viruses reactivate without the persistence. I mean, that's, that's what we're trying to figure out, which is the degree to which viral persistence might be then causing other problems, dysbiosis, for example, or is it that those are incited by the acute infection and have nothing to do with persistence? So this is all leading us to this question, whether or not it would make sense to use an agent like Paxlovid, shown to be effective in acute setting, a, a, a pill, an oral pill that is, is fairly well tolerated. Safety protocol is quite good. Some people are bothered by dysgeusia and other effects. It's not like any drug without, without any 
issues, but in general is well tolerated for five days. Could it be used as an agent that would help us address long COVID? And, and might we need to use it for a little bit longer because we know that when people are treated for five days for acute COVID, there are people with rebound. So sort of leading us to think about this idea of this medication as being a good one to try. It's out there well tolerated, but maybe for a little bit longer period of time than had been used within the acute treatment trial. So if you look at clinicaltrials.gov, several trials are testing Paxlovid for long COVID. And, and what I was really asked to do in this presentation is present the clinical data in support of Paxlovid for long COVID. And, and I'm here to tell you that these trials are ongoing. I mean, it's really conceptual about we know that Paxlovid is effective against the virus. We have a, a belief that, that the viral persistence is a central driver of long COVID. And then the question is using an antiviral like Paxlovid, would that be good for the treatment of long COVID? And so we're seeing the, that these are four uh, prominent trials that, that are out there, one from Stanford, uh, one from uh, Yale, the one that I talked to you about for Pax LC, one from the Recover Group. Uh, that's the large billion-dollar initiative to study long COVID that the federal government has undertaken through the NIH, and one is a Swedish study. So let's take a little bit deeper dive and take a look at what's going on with these studies. The Stanford uh, Stop Pask Paxlovid trial is a site-based, single-site-based study, uh, which has five visits over five weeks with 15 days of dosing. Uh, they include people with at least Two symptoms of moderate to severe intensity, uh, are diagnosed with long COVID and have fatigue, brain fog, shortness of breath, body aches, GI symptoms, or CV symptoms. And their primary endpoint is the change in the core symptom severity scale, uh, assessed on a four-point Likert uh, uh, scale, which is you don't have any of these, they're mild, they're moderate or severe, and it's assessed at week 10. In addition, they have a wearable substudy. There's some people who are willing, uh, they had to have an iPhone and they, 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 they have wearables uh, I, uh, and that they're gonna be tracking uh, a lot of the information that can be derived from the wearables. They enrolled 168 people of 200. They stopped the study prematurely and the results are pending. We, do, we don't really know exactly uh, what the results will be. They're continuing to follow people. And uh, you know they, they're holding open, I guess, the possibility they could even enroll more. But for now, they're not enrolling anymore. And, and we don't really know uh, what they found. The uh, second study I want to talk about is the Recover Vital Paxlovid study. Now, the NIH and the Recover study, with their efforts to study a wide variety of interventions, have built a, a large platform. And, and this platform is intended to be reusable and to be able to be uh, applied to a wide variety of different kinds of interventions to test for their success in mitigating or even uh, eliminating symptoms for people who are living with long COVID. This, the Recover Vital studies focusing on antiviral strategies, focusing on this viral persistence theory, and they're in fact using Paxlovid. This is site-based. They say they've got about 100 sites, so a kind of traditional approach. In this study, they've got three arms. Again, they've got other clinical trials going on, but in this one, they've got three arms, a 25-day dosing of Paxlovid, so longer than Stanford longer than PAX-LC, longer than what, what, what's going on in Swedish study, 25-day dosing, and a 15-day dosing. And there's a placebo arm. That's the three arms. They're going to include 900 people. And people are included if they've got at least moderate symptoms from the same symptom cluster, identified via this cluster-targeted COVID-19 symptom questionnaire. And the primary endpoint is a change in cognitive function using the pro promised cognitive function 8A, or change in autonomic function using the orthostatic hypotension questionnaire, or change in exercise tolerance using the DSQ PEM, and they're really focusing on the PEM. All uh, baseline is, is a change from baseline to, to day 90. And uh, enrollment right now is by invitation. Uh, I assume they're gonna open up more broadly. They've got a lot of people to draw on. They're well-resourced. Uh, th this study is in progress uh, and just starting to enroll. Now, the Karolinska prolific Paxlovid trial, the, the third trial, is a single site, uh, uh, 15 days of Paxlovid, uh, like Stanford, like Pax-LC, will enroll 400 people. So Stanford was going to enroll 200. They enrolled 168. They, they prematurely ended. Uh, this one is 400 people to two to one ratio, two to one, meaning that uh, twice as many people will get the Paxlovid to the placebo. They're using WHO definition of severe pass. And the primary endpoint is a change in quality of life at day 
16 measured by the EQ5D 5L VAS scale. And they're also doing immune phenotyping. I mean, I assume, by the way, that Stanford uh, uh, probably collected biospecimens. I, I really am not sure. And I'm sure that the recovery trial is also doing as well. So there, there will be a lot of other secondary studies done in all of these. They're more or less signal finding. I mean, they're not large scale studies, mostly phase two studies that are uh, trying to understand whether or not this is having an effect, get some idea about who may be benefiting and, uh, and try to help us learn. I mean, that's the importance of these kinds of studies. What's the safety of extended dosing? How tolerable, how, how did people tolerate it? And do we have any clues about people actually responding to it? So that's the sort of stage we're in. Now, let me just talk a little bit about our trial. I'm gonna take a little bit longer. It is our trial, so I'll give you a little more color about what it is, a Yale PaxLC trial. It's digital, decentralized, democratized, 15 days of Paxlovid, like Stanford, like, like what one of the arms is doing in, in NIH, like what Swedish study. We're gonna roll 100 people, it's one-to-one, -one, you know, 50-50. Uh, we looked for people who not only were diagnosed with long COVID, but had health that was good or excellent before the long COVID, and now it's fair to poor. So we were trying to get people that were a good contrast of, of doing well before, not doing so well now. The primary endpoint we, we selected is a general endpoint. It's a change in the PROMISE 29 physical health score. And, and our thought was that, that this is sort of a large scale assessment of how people feel. And uh, we're bringing in people with all sorts of different symptoms so we're really looking like, can we say at the end of the day, has their health improved? We're also doing immune phenotyping and collecting a whole range of other metrics and measures to try to understand, uh, did, are there any evidence that people got better? We'll have the EQVAS, just like the Swedish study too. They may be able to make a comparison, see how, how we did. But, but you know, each of these groups has a little different recruitment strategy, a little different group of people, different prime, uh, uh, primary endpoints. And, but are collecting a whole bunch of data that I think we'll be able to crosswalk across the studies. Uh, our goals were really to test, test safety and efficacy of this, seek signals of response, create a database for further investigation, and, and really develop this digital decentralized approach. Now, with this approach, we're enrolling from 48 states across the United States. It is a, a United States only study, in part because we're collecting biospecimens uh, at baseline and at day 28. We need to get those to Kiko Iwasaki's lab. Did I not mention? She's my co-lead on this. She's terrific, amazing. Her lab is doing deep immune phenotyping. And so, you know, we needed to be able to ship. And so we had to restrict to the United States, contiguous to the United States, in fact, to get it there to her in time. But, um, but we can recruit from all across the United States. One site, one IRB works seamlessly. And so we're really trying to break ground on this participant centricity, making it convenient for people to be part of the studies and, and making it so they don't have to travel to sites. We don't have that uh, over, overhead of trying to make these contracts and IRBs and then having to work through what it means to patients to have to travel. So the innovations in this trial, national study, no sites, one IRB, people sort of step forward. They're not being selected by the docs, but we're, we're reaching out to them personally. Data integrations, real-time data flows, participant uh, centered design, town halls with access to investigators as we return results to them after we know the results, digital endpoints, home-based biospecimen collection, clinical basic science collaboration between the Kiko Iwasaki's lab and the clinical investigators, and much more. It, it has this online screening, a medical record review that's done digitally and almost in real time, e-consent. We, we ship meds to people's homes. We do local blood draws. And, and we are having all of these online diaries, collecting a lot of information, all of it digital, all of it uh, at adding to the efficiency of the trial. And I believe, like I said, breaking new ground on the way that we can do research, engaging the participants as partners, listening to them, trying to make it so it's suitable to them getting their input as we design this trial so that it would be one that they would wanna join, feel proud. We wanna delight them by their participation. We wanna make it so they would brag about that they were part of the study and tell others to join similar studies in the future. This is an example of the kind of emails we get from people Eric Crumholtz, thank you for your email. I, I, I email people and thank them for the participation as they finish the meds. I'm honored to be part of this pioneering study. It's a silver lining to my ongoing symptoms. Please continue the important work and know that I want to contribute, continue contributing in any way I can. I don't do this because it was a nice for me to receive this. I'm showing you that we can configure trials where people are thrilled to be participating, delighted by it, and, and really want to continue with it. And, and that's really our goal. 
So I want to thank all the people on our side, by the way, since I'm giving this talk, I want to particularly personally uh, thank people who represent researchers, patients, uh, those who are, are, are supporting us uh, and all of their contributions, what they've taught us. I would say one thing about us as investigators, we're learning all the time from those who are affected by this condition and they're helping us be better investigators. And so this idea of Paxlovid is coming about as antiviral, testing this viral persistence mechanism and a whole bunch of trials should be teaching us very soon about who this works in, does it work, for whom, and, and what can we do to advance our understanding of the underlying mechanism of this condition. Thank you very much for your attention um, and feel free to contact me if you have any questions.